So, I mean, it's been a full moon this week and I'm just looking up at that full moon thinking this is amazing that my art is going to be there along with the Chinese because I think that's a big race now to get landing modules on the moon and who's going to be there. So pretty cool, huh? I love Eastern philosophy and, and he brings a lot of that into his kind of art mentorship. It's almost like there's a formula with art and as long as you don't force it and you don't push it, um, it almost seems like everybody's got an artist inside of them. The so, uncertainty principle. Yeah, the right. The uncertainty yeah. principle. The observer changes the outcome. That's so it. Yeah. We must, if we are the observer and we have that kind of power, it's back to beyond your wildest dreams. You know, like what could you imagine and not even imagine that something could happen, but you just know it can. That's enough to get that ball rolling so that you are able to create solutions. We to this problem that we have that we're having, which is global and not just over there. Hello, everybody. It's Reagan Archbald, and welcome to Unreasonable Health. And today, you guys are in for a treat. I think many of you heard me talk about my love for art and how I believe that, you know, the artistic side is uh, one of the most important uh, pieces of medicine. And um, one of my my friends, uh, someone who I've had the pleasure of working with, uh, I've invited her onto the show because not only is she a phenomenally talented artist, but she's got a heart of gold and a big vision to make art more accessible. And she's going to show you some really interesting ways of looking at um, art in, and seeing art all around you in ways you probably never even realized. And so I want to uh, introduce you all to Becky Robbins. And Becky, welcome to the show. Thank you, Reagan. I'm so happy to talk to you. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. And and so, you know, if you look at it, for those of you who aren't uh, watching this, uh, if you're listening on the podcast, that's fine. But you can look behind you, Becky, and you've got all this art going on. And so you swim in art every single mm -hmm. day. How does your brain work? How do you how do you start identifying art in your day to day life? Well, I think it starts way upstream from there because I'm first of all, we're never not creating. We're creating with every thought that we have. Our brains are like a GPS, you know, that that if I type in your address, you know, in Salt Lake City, Utah, you know, my GPS is going to always take me there. You know, they're so accurate these days. And I think our thought process is exactly the same. And um, so when I say going upstream, I mean, I never wanted to be an artist. It wasn't anything I ever thought of. I actually wanted to be a doctor. And then oh, I wow. downgraded that because I didn't feel like I had enough time. And I had a, a one-year-old at the time. So I went into nurses training and became a nurse. So I'm really, I love anatomy and biology and all of that is, is magic to me because this system we live within is such a miracle. I feel like I'm standing inside a living miracle, you know, all every day. And you know so much about this miracle that I, I can't even understand some of the words that <laughs> You know, when you're describing something to me, you have such a grasp on this, and I don't even know how you do it. <laughs> uh, about creativity, though, since we're always creating, I manage what I expose myself to, which is a little harder these days, right? Because so mm -hmm. much is going on in the world. And it um, and I manage like I don't watch the news if I can help it. I don't I don't watch horror movies, you know, because <laughs> I don't, you know, and I'm 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 um even in my studio where I am right now, I consider this to be like a sacred space. And mm. I don't, I don't, um, there are not a lot of people that come in my, in my studio and I don't listen to music when I paint because mm. it can hijack me if it has lyrics, you know, or, you know, music touches such an emotional part of us that I'm careful what I listen to, or, you know, sometimes I'll listen to historical fiction or something that's just like noise in the background because I'm not thinking when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. So I keep myself clear like that so that there, when I have, I, it's like my art is more intuitive. It comes in that way. So it's almost like a, you know, if you clear your mind, then you can get downloads that can help you create something that's really powerful. 
And um, and so when you see, are, are you getting these intuitive things? Do, do they come in shapes? How does it show up in your brain when you when you go to create a piece of art? Well, I have I might have an idea about something. Someone will will tell me a story, or I will uh, read something, and I'll and then I'm curious. I think that's part of being a creator is having an active sense of curiosity, which mm. I know you do. I oh, think yeah. it's like. Like looking at something, I have your book right here, by the way. I just sent, oh, this no way. To, sent this to a guy in India this morning because we were, he said, do you know what biohacking is? And I said, this is biohacking. This is, <laughs> this is oh, like the best you. example yeah. of biohacking I know of. So we had a great conversation about that because he was curious. And I think curiosity mm-hmm. is so important. And your question is, how did those images come in? So if I'm reading something or learning something and I just, it just gives me an idea about about anything really and then i find go and find an image that might or i'll think of an image that will support that and sometimes it's from my own photography or a book i've seen sometimes it's someone who i know this amazing guy in amsterdam who is a great sketcher and he has like these black and white sketches and so i I go to him and say hey would it be possible for you to give me permission to paint my version of your image into my art and you know what that's turned out to be so much fun because I feel it's more collaborative and I feel like I'm then shining the light on other people because I give everybody credit. So that's one way that I do that. Okay. And then it just one at a time, my art is made up of lots of individual images that then start to tell a story. And then I connect them all with what I call my line work, because I believe that we are all connected to one another. In fact, I have, I don't think you can see it because it's a little higher than my monitor, but I have a neon sign in my office that says we belong to one another which i also believe so yeah it comes in fits and spurts and middle of the night and ideas that i jot down and like i'm always it's always i I feel like i have a it's like a freeway that things are coming coming and going all the time it's fun well and and you're also you know deeply connected into uh you know states of higher consciousness and you recognize that there's you know a, a just this uh, energy field that, you know, unites us all. And so uh, I think art, um, you know, one of the first conversations you and I had, I said, um, I, I'm not really an artist by the, by means of like, I don't draw things. I don't, I, you know, I don't really have um, that side of it, but I, I do love to see the art of when I can put treatment protocols together for people and just see the magic that can happen where I was like, I had no idea, like, you know, cause it's just like with you sometimes intuitively, I'm like, you know what? I think for this, this client of mine, that's got kidney failure. What if I use ARA 290 SS 31 and then work on, you know, an unrelated pathway, you know, and, and all of a sudden I start seeing their GFR improve and other things improve. And so mm-hmm. I think in medicine, we've been so indoctrinated that it needs to be down just to the science and put inside of a little box. And, and if not, then you got lawyers breathing down your neck. And, and so uh, what, what I've realized is that I I think what, what the world needs more of is uh, more art, more trusting in that, that deeper sense of connection and intuition. But what are some ways that you fostered it over the years? If you didn't want to be an artist um, and you're, Pretty soon, you've got a really cool thing where your art's literally going to be placed on the the south south node of the moon. Um, yeah. That is awesome. So, how did you go from not being an artist to um, doing such big things with your work? Well, first of all, I mean that's an easy question and kind of a crazy question to answer because. After nursing, I got into business. I didn't stay with nursing for too long because the patient care side of it, I think I'm so empathic that it was really, uh, you know, and as a student nurse and a young nurse, they want to give you all the tough stuff to kind of weed out the weakness, you know, of people. But I um, I then went into business and I was a, a creator of a global um, self-help company. And I think that, that that taught me so much. I went from not knowing anything about that to creating this company, which took a number of years and, and learning along the way. And I feel like I, um, and I'm, I love learning. I love learning about all different kinds of things. And so when I left that world, that, that self-help world, um, mm-hmm. and there's something else I want to say about that too, but, um, but when I left that, I went to uh, a, a friend of mine who was an attorney who had to retire for a health reason. 
she didn't know you yet. I bet it could have helped her. But she um, she said, oh, I'm take, I'm, I ran into her one day and she said, how are you? What are you doing? She goes, well, I'm taking Spanish lessons, piano lessons, gardening, art class. And she goes, you should come with me to something. And I said, I'll come with you to an art class. So that was really the start of it because I'm not a trained artist. I never, you know, I took a couple of local art classes in La Jolla at a little place there. And so, you know, I learned how to draw a straight line. Do you want to know how to draw a straight line, Reagan? Uh, I'd love to know. Yes. <laughs> some people some people think like, oh, I can't even draw a stick figure. Okay. Well, you actually can because in order to draw a straight line, which we did, you take your pen. Yep. You put a dot at the end of the, on one side of the paper. You could even do this. And yep. then you put a dot on the other side of the paper. Yep. And now you go back to that first dot. Yep. Take your pen or your pencil or something. And okay. at, with your pen on the first dot now only look at that second dot don't even look at your pen just look at that second dot and, and draw that line not bad <laughs> right it's kind of like hitting awesome. a baseball you know if you watch the ball hit yeah. the bat right it's like eye hand coordination so our brain does that for us so i started out drawing a straight learning how to draw a straight line yeah. and then which is so there's so many analogies to that right and then the next lesson was, okay, so look out the window. We're going to draw that tree. I'm like, well, I can't even, I can never draw a tree. I'm not an artist. They said, no, we're not going to draw the tree. We're going to draw the parts, just shapes that are not the tree. So mm. draw what's not the tree. And you just keep drawing what's not. And all of a sudden you've got the tree because it just kind of materializes. So that yeah. kind of magic was so fun for me. And, and it just stimulated me because there's so many ways you can use art in life. And um, so here I am all these years later. And about the moon thing, I mean, how could you even imagine that? Like, I love the name of your podcast because unreasonable is sort of what you have to be in life these days is like um, about like, what do you want? What would you want to do that is beyond your wildest dreams? Because I yeah. think if we if we know, like someone said to me, like um, about do I want to sit in on a goal setting session? This was some women that I, I had met a while early and they were going on a weekend. We all went on a weekend together and they said, we know someone who can do goal setting. And I said, I'll bow out of that because I don't really believe in goal setting. Because if I believed in goal setting, I would have a specific goal in mind. But that's not all I want in life. You know, I want something that's unreasonable, that's beyond my wild imagination. Because if I shoot for that, for sure, I'm going to get the goal, but I'm probably going to get way beyond that, mm, way yep. beyond that. So I love having an unreasonable expectation like that, because then it leaves the universe can then fulfill anything I want it to fulfill instead of me having limits. So I don't believe in limits. So back to the moon. I mean, I could not have even imagined that, but I, I was interviewed here in my studio by an Australian guy who um, was here for like a day and it was like a 30 minute episode or an hour long episode. And it was really fun. And I, he filmed me painting and filmed, you know, all various things. We talked about art. And then I got a phone call about probably a year and a half ago by now saying, Hey, the, this has been picked up by a guy who's a physicist who created a time capsule because he wanted to represent art in all different categories and different kinds of artists. So it would last into perpetuity and take it to the moon because there are lunar landing modules. There's some already have gone. There's three of them, actually, three different different ones that are going to the moon. Mine is in the Polaris one, the Polaris landing module, because they're putting man, they're preparing, we are in this country preparing to put man on the moon again. So they're delivering equipment and stuff. So yeah. he just thought, let's put a time capsule in with it and let's like leave it on the moon. So, I mean, it's been a full moon this week. And I'm just looking up <laughs> at that full moon thinking this is, amazing that my art is going to be there along with the Chinese. Cause I think that's a big race now to get landing modules on the moon and who's going to be there. So pretty cool, huh? Isn't that cool. Um, and, and uh, I mean, it's just, it, it's in a time capsule. So who did you know that's going, so it's, is it SpaceX that's taking it up or what? It's SpaceX because um, other people have other rockets and NASA right. have some. And so, Elon Musk, the only one and only Elon, yeah, um, bid got the you know bid on it and won the bid for a Viper rocket. So my art's going in a Viper rocket. I just think that is so cool. <laughs> so I keep checking on when's it going to happen, so can I can go and witness the launch and film the launch because 
that'd be fun for the TV show that I'm creating to have that, you know, be there in person when it goes up. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Man, that, that that's so pretty cool. unreasonable. <laughs> that would that be unreasonable. Incre- that's, that's unreasonable art right there. Hey, I want it on the moon. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> that's so cool. So uh, tell us about the show, because that's that's been a big project of yours that it's not like five years ago you had a goal to have a you know, a, 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 a series. I think you've, you've already recorded a bunch of these, haven't you? We have. Um, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about this because that's another thing that I never dreamed of. Like I want to be a host of a TV show. And it actually came to me by asking myself, someone else posed this to me, which I think is such a great question is to say like, what do you, and take your time to answer it like over a couple of days, but like, what do you, what is your passion? What do you really, really love? And and what are your desires in life? And just sit with that and let and let that because it's different. It, it's different when you just sit with it. And so one morning I was sitting, I meditate and I do a heart math meditation every morning. If you don't know about heart math, oh, it is so so important. Oh, nice. And I do that every morning. It's my non-negotiable morning practice. And while I was sitting in sitting after that, you can drop into a really deep meditation after doing, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes of the heart math program, which is an app on my phone. And I was sitting there and this idea came to me about a, a memory of a guy named James Lipton, who did a show called Inside the Actor Studio long, long ago, where he brought up on stage like De Niro and, you know, various Spielberg and people that he would just sit there and interview at NYU. And I don't know how that thought came into my head. And it was like, you should do this, Becky, with with artists of all genres of the arts. And the reason why is because we as a culture, I'm not sure if this is true in other cultures. I think maybe in some cultures it's a little bit different. But we here are you so used to jumping in our beautiful car and driving it or wearing something great that we love or a dish or this glass that was blown a glass blown by somebody we just use. We don't right. realize what it takes to get from nothing to actual fruition mm-hmm. on something. It takes, yeah. there are so many hurdles that it takes to get the, to get right here, like the, the ceramic sitting behind you. Like someone had to learn how to do that for trial and error. And we, we call it, um, my daughter had an acting class. She's an actor. And long ago she was in an improv class and the, and the teacher of the class at Christmas time gave them a an inscribed like a Yeti cup that said, dare to suck. Like you have to dare oh. to suck <laughs> because you're going to suck for a long time, you yep. know, at something. And one of the people we interviewed for the show, his name is Nathan East. He's probably the most recorded and respected bass player in the world, Nathan East and his son, Noah East. And and he was saying that Quincy Jones told him one time that if you want to learn to play the trumpet, you're you're going to sound horrible. He used a different word for a year before your lips and your lips are going to hurt. and It's going to be terrible and you're not going to make a good sound at least a year. So that dare to suck thing is like those are obstacles that you have to overcome without any guarantee that it's ever going to turn into anything, because in the arts, like you start, you can get like get a great gig. And then when the gig's over, you have to get another gig. Well, if mm-hmm. you are an artist, you paint a painting and then it's done. And now like, now what? You know, you start another painting or how are you going to sell that? How are you going to get that in front of somebody's eyes who perceive it as being valuable? Or, I mean, there's so many, I can go on and on about that, but it's different than building a business where, as I know, since I did built one, that yeah. the, that business becomes valuable over time and you could even sell that business for and then create a whole new thing or keep on doing it and stay making money for for decades but it's not the same in the arts so it came to me to interview these people and just see what their journey has been and but most of all to entice the public into number one an appreciation for it and number two like being courageous and curious and maybe it's something someone else always wish they could do i mean like this show like someone might get on this show and um, maybe someone in my world who says like, oh my God, I need to, I've always been interested in anatomy and physiology and I want to know more about what Reagan is doing and how I can learn from him, you know, that kind of a thing. So it's yeah. my, it's my dream. Well, I didn't know I had. <laughs> that is amazing. What, what is the series called and where, where will it be uh, available? It's called the art of art. Oh, it's cool. Like a verb yeah. and a noun. 
and we we've got a sizzle reel that we're that we are uh debuting this coming saturday and and uh, then the sizzle reel will go out um, representing five different episodes of five vastly different creators really fun amazing stories that they've told me and it's it's exciting and fun and it's beautiful it's like cinematography is gorgeous it's not barely becky on there but it's just like maybe voiceover becky and like incredible stories with people and i think it's going to be really fun so where we end up the pitch of it you know is we're gonna we'll see after this sizzle reel comes out but i know it's gonna be it's that beyond my wildest dreams thing wow i love that the art of art and so these these five creators that you've interviewed so far what's been the most surprising thing that you've noticed oh wow okay well just the last week we interviewed a woman who won the art prize the art prize is given once a year to an outstanding emerging artist in this country it's a hundred thousand dollar prize so that they can then live off that money so they can afford to to live you know to eat and pay their rent and that kind of a yeah. thing and she lives in a home i actually met her um because i was touring the crystal bridges museum which is in arkansas and had the good fortune of having alice walton who was uh who created that who's the heir to the wall walmart fortune and she that's her her museum crystal bridges which is magnificent and beautiful okay. piece of architecture and she took us around and we walked into a room and there was this incredible art done by the woman that i interviewed last week and so she said you've got to go meet her so i did last week and she had she lives in burbank her studio is right there out back of her house and she has a horse in her backyard a horse an actual full-size horse she's had this horse for like 20 years in cool. that inner backyard, in a, like a stall, you know, a little area really? in the backyard. She has like four rabbits, 10 cats, five dogs, you know, all of this kind of stuff all around her. And she uses all those creatures in her art to figure out how to, you know, the uh, is the when the horse is lying down, she takes pictures of how the horse is lying. And then she uses mm. that to how is an elephant lying. I mean, it was so, so shocking to go in her backyard she goes did you ever remember mr ed there was a show on television about this talking horse that was the actual home where that horse lived where they filmed a lot of that so that was crazy you know, yeah wow. that was funny so i had dogs and cats around me the whole shoot you know people <laughs> like wanting to be you know contention and wanting to be held and wanting to you know all of that it was great and, and and so it sounds like um, she's got a very similar um, uh, kind of uh, theme that you've got, which is curiosity, you know, always piecing things together and seeing how, you know, things that may not seem related at the onset, art brings those things together. Yeah. So, so what is the art of art? I mean, what, how would you summarize it? It's a show that is beautiful to watch, interesting and keeps your attention, that stimulates people, that entertains you, that might make you laugh, um, that definitely will get you on an emotional level to think like, wow, you know, the stories that people have that, you know, I don't love having the idea that we all have to go through so much strife in order to create because I don't think that's necessary. However, I do know that that an artist is a very sensitive person you know, someone who's more empathic than we feel things on a deep level. And so we're pretty sensitive to our environment and sensitive to other people and, and, and sensitive in a good way too. Like I'm walking down the street and I'll see a flower or a butterfly I just saw a few minutes ago. And it just stops me in my tracks. And it reminded me, oh, I had a dream last night that this butterfly kept landing on my hand and coming back and forth. So the art of art show, I think will entice people into their own creativity and also, mm -hmm. I do want to mention this, though, that there are so many artists that out there that know once they've we're including emerging people on the show and also people who are very well known and famous in the culture. And some of the people that have been in doing what they do for a while have realized the importance of of helping other people in their community and that that relate they relate to like when artist is going back to detention facilities because that detention facility he was in and helped him so much. And so, you know, oh, things like cool. that, like really giving back to the community. So I think that, I mean, that we're, we're kind of, we hear that all the time, giving back, but I mean, like really in a real way, like people doing something that really matters as their legacy. Wow. 
That's so powerful. And then uh, I could imagine the art of art will also help people realize that maybe we're all artists somewhere in us. And, and I think that was, um, you know, I, I read uh, Rick Rubin's book is probably one of the top five books. I've given more copies of that out to anybody The the creative act is what it's called. Yeah. And um, love that book. Uh, it's so good because, you know, and I, I do, uh, obviously I, I love Eastern philosophy and, and he brings a lot of that into his kind of art mentorship but um, it's almost like there's a formula with art. And as long as you don't force it and you don't push it, um, it almost seems like everybody's got an artist inside of them. Well, we were created, you know, so we were <laughs> created and we are able to create. And I believe that um, especially, you know, Reagan, the, where the world is right now, which is mm -hmm. devastating. Oh, man. Um, there will need to be solutions that haven't been thought of before. And there'll need to be um, a sense of solitude where you can then come up with, with some ideas that are outside of, of the norm of what hasn't worked all hasn't worked. And all of that is what artists do all the time. You know, you're, I make mistakes. I'm careful because I, I work on a white background, but if I make a mistake, I have to live with it. And I think that that I love Rick Rubin's book too because I believe that he's been around you know he's been around creators for a long time and he's seen what the upsides and downsides of it are and I think I I think we've never been in a time like this in our lifetimes and I want to figure out how I can participate in the in the creative solution for this and the best way is for me to to stay in my lane meaning stay stay in my own sense of um solution solution oriented positivity so mm -hmm. if, otherwise i'm contributing negative energy to an already negative situation so if i'm going to be devastated and depressed and have angst all day that first of all i can't create out of that and i think i wouldn't want to hang a piece of art in my home that is full of angst and devastation and misery Ooh. you know i don't think that adds value i sure, for sure wouldn't want it in a home that had children in it so mm. I think that, but my responsibility is to be, you know, sort of like the Gandhi quote, you know, be that which you seek, you know, and also the other thing that he said is not allowing someone to walk through your mind with dirty feet, you know, that whole thing. Oh, wow. That's, I've never heard that, but that is powerful. It is powerful. Um, yeah. Albert Einstein, uh, towards the end of his life, Gandhi became his uh, hero. Uh, I, I just finished a, a, an autobiography on Albert Einstein. I was like, oh, I had no idea because Einstein was uh, very much a uh, pacifist. And then he, you know, of, of course, he figured out the uh, equation for the atomic bomb. And so his, uh, you know, the way that he got uh, some resolution in his guilt ridden soul was uh, uh, speaking up against uh, some of the atrocities that were going on. And obviously, they're going on right now in Israel. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's Oh, it, gives me, it gives me shivers to think of that. Thank yeah. you. I'm, I'll read it. I will. Uh, I'll yeah. let me. I want to see which exact version of it that you read. It's uh, Walter Isaacson's. Okay, perfect. Albert Einstein. Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Uh, phenomenal, but um, but Einstein, even as a you know, he's a, a physicist, right? And you think of him as a, a hardcore scientist, but he said uh, imagination is so much more powerful than knowledge because uh, it encircles the world. Like you can't you can't hold it back. And so uh, I think what um, what you're doing with art is so fascinating and, and powerful. So so if you look at the um, the art of art. Um, and you're looking, you know, five years, 10 years into the future, um, you know, it, it seems like this is a project that might not ever end. I mean, it could, it could far outlive you, Becky. I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool. Well, with your help, I'll live longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. we're. Good. I mean, that's, yeah, not, yeah, we got another hundred years, but uh, beyond that. <laughs> but, but yeah, thank you. Because, you know, one of the things that I see for the show, um, I'm still I'm still in the aftermath of what we just talked about with Einstein and all of that. And I think that the timing, what the timing of this episode is important, you yeah. know, because I mean, he was a Jewish man and he's mm -hmm. like, oh, my goodness. You know, I mean, I think one of the things that I listened to yesterday is the importance of us not eradicating anyone. You know, like there's we were all born 
innocent babies and children. And out of that became, you know, what what's occurring right now. You know, you're not born this way with this kind of hatred and Mm -hmm. and um, all of that. So I'm 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 really excited to read the book about my longevity. I think that. I think maybe I mentioned this to you that I was talking to someone who's in who manages two big art museums here, and he was saying, you know, Becky, what I think you, a, a next series, your next series could be art and biotech, and art oh, and technology yeah. because like they're they're not necessarily, you know, meeting in the middle. I mean, there's a big. I live in San Diego with a big biotech community, and then San Francisco has a big tech community, but they don't neither support the arts very much. And mm-hmm. I mean, my art going to the moon is an example of art and tech, right? So I, I love mm-hmm. the idea that we could then, the next series of, of artists that like we focus on that. You know, I know a guy who's an amazing heart lung transplant surgeon. I also know a physicist mm-hmm. who's a nanophysicist who was the guy who invented the very first microscope to take a picture of an atom. Imagine that. I mean, I don't even, oh. uh, that's crazy for me. And his his paper on that within appeared in a science magazine with the photo and Gerhard Richter, who's a very famous artist. I think he's 90 or something by now lived nearby this in Germany, nearby my friend who invented the the microscope. His name is Franz Geibel. I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's spelled G S E I B L E. You know, anyway, Franz, he and Gerhard used this picture and created the whole wall in the young museum in San Francisco of these tiles using the photograph of that atom. And then later realized he should have asked permission to the guy who originated that, but they all became friends over it and all is well. But I sat down to talk with Franz about this one. I said, can I talk to you about spirituality for a few minutes? Because there's a blend there. And I said, I know about the Heisenberg principle where they were using a splitter to split. I might have the facts wrong, but I have the, I have the, I have the moral of the story right. Like yeah. to split an atom and it kept they couldn't replicate the, the experiment exactly ever. And they finally realized that the observer was That's changing it. the outcome. The so, uncertainty principle. Yeah, the right. Uncertainty yeah. principle. The observer changes the outcome. That's so it. Yeah. We must, if we are the observer and we have that kind of power, it's back to beyond your wildest dreams, you know, like what could you imagine and not even imagine that something could happen, but you just know it can, that's enough to get that ball rolling so that you are able to create solutions. We, to this problem that we have, that we're having, which is global and not just over there, but we need to realize that it's, it's in every single one of us and that we belong to one another. And, uh, you know, so I feel like my art has a message. Each piece of my art has a different story attached to it. And I, you know, when I'm not here anymore, you know, I want that. I want my originals to be somewhere in the world that people can stand in front of them and see what they mean because they all have something different. But but it's from a higher purpose. So yeah. thank you for that. That's a long answer to your short question. But it, it was not. No, I love that because it creates context, right? I mean, art is is a way that we can time travel essentially, mm. and it. I mean, future. It can put us into the future. It can help us have bigger aspirations for our life. It also can take us back to times of the past that we may be nostalgic for, and and so. Uh, I think it's really powerful. And and so you were, you've were you told me several times how you're using some AI um, applications in your art. I think Mid Journey is one of the, the, um, the, the bots that you're using. Uh, but how are you bringing in um, some of the new AI technology into your artwork? Interesting about that, because I know a guy well. He's an amazing, brilliant, genius mind. His name is Alan D. Thompson. And uh, he's got he's got a, a paper he calls the memo that comes out a couple of times a month where he lists all the newest, very latest to the minute information that's going on in the whole AI world. He knows everything about it. And so he encouraged me to try mid journey in my art. And I didn't want to because I, wait, wait, you don't understand, you know, how it comes through me and all of that. So but I tried it. So we set it set up my computer and um, with mid journey. And then I had my lap, my um iPad sitting next to it. And I kept referring back to images I painted on some of my art and, and then figuring out how do you write basically an adjective, like a story of what that is like, 
Like how do you prompt it? it which is they call a prompt. So yes. I was learning all of all the lingo and I was learning all of that, you know, and then he just said, okay, you're on your own. So start creating. So I, I did create a whole painting. Basically, I call it a painting of these images that I that I'd already painted. And then I just described them and push a button and see like 10 seconds later, what comes up on a computer is mind blowing. Mm. And, and I mean, this seriously was crazy for me. And also to know that that's one of one, like I can't, I can't put that prompt back in there again and have that same thing come up for me. Right. It's a completely different image then. So, I mean, there, I know there's all these, there's controversy about it, but I feel like, and he said, look, Becky, you now own that IP for that because it's an original one of a kind and never yeah. to be created again. And I know there's controversy, but I'm just going with what I believe right now. So the, it was an interesting thing because it wasn't as emotionally rewarding to me in the beginning. Yeah. And because I felt like, I mean, first of all, I spend I, each one of these pieces that are sitting around me take like nine months to a year to paint. So I'm really connected to them by the time I'm done. But this piece, so I had like, all, I don't know, 13 images or something. So then I placed them on a, on a board like I have, had my printer come photograph. You know, I took a picture of it we created a whole board made out of these images that I then connected with actual paint, you know, myself connected them all with all my connecting lines. And it's such a cool, it's such a cool piece. He's showing it around the world actually in some of his keynote speeches and he's showing it to governments and, and um, 500 surgeons and law enforcement and legal. And, you know, so it's fun to see like what that was. So in the current piece I'm doing, there are, there are like three images in there that I went I went on mid journey to just like like talk about what I wanted, you know, talking to the computer about what I, my ideas were, and up came a couple, and I thought I have to paint this. It is so beautiful. Wow! That I just have to actually paint it onto my canvas, and so I've done that. So it's really fun. And what I believe about this is that it's all coming through me. You yep. know, it's coming through this channel that I that I of my ideas and my outrageous ideas my unreasonable expectation and it comes up in a on on the computer screen and it's fun to play with and and um so i know that there's so much about ai that's amazing and so much that's not amazing and i think that that's up to us as humans um to use our ingenuity and also our our compassion to to be willing to see what's right and what's not wrong about all of it yeah i i couldn't agree more because it's you know, it's it's things that we're feeding into AI, which is what you know is going to dictate the direction we take it. It's just a tool, and so um, I think it's going to be fascinating. One of my dreams for it is having an application where, when people are learning, because I, I do a lot of courses for medical um, people on peptides, right, and I'm mm. I'm trying to help them understand the pathways, and there's a sequential. Uh, set of pathways that if you learn those, then it becomes a lot more intuitive. And I'm, I've tried to get AI to draw the pathways, but it's still, you know, they're inaccurate. And so I think we're going to have some AI that will have a lot more accuracy in biology. And I think it will really help kids understand better when they can say, okay, drop, drop the mitochondria in the organelles of the cell. And now show me, show me the DNA, the double helix. And and uh, what are all the letters on the DNA and, and what are yeah. telomeres? I mean, I just think it, it's going to be such a fascinating way to learn. And then the AI can ask us back, you know, okay, well, well, is this correct? Did I draw it correctly or is there anything missing? And I think, um, I mean, I could just see that application in the next five years is, is just creating uh, a non-intimidating way of really understanding biology and, and medicine. So I'm I'm really excited about it and for that. And there's a thousand other reasons why it's um, pretty. Yeah, exciting. I love that. I haven't thought of that. I'm looking up something right now. I want to I want to make sure I have the, the name of this on um, this doctor. Right. Um, he he's an emergency room physician, Dr. Harvey Castro. He's also an amazing guy who's an emergency room doctor, and he's created all kinds of of ways. Like, for example, he was explaining to me, like, if you you go out and and someone's exhibiting like cardiac symptoms and then an ambulance goes to their home that with with these things he's putting together with AI that by the time they get him to the hospital they've already diagnosed him the emergency room is waiting with the, waiting with the right equipment and the right kind of doctor and 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 they can, they're saving lives he's got so many protocols he's already creating 
um, that are um, amazing for learning and teaching. So I agree with you. The only right. thing that I think, and, and I'm sure it's being, it's being addressed is that the, the information that's in the, in the major learning language models are, it was like, as of like two or three years ago, right. those, yeah. it, it's not updated. And mm -hmm. some of the, some of the, um, the liberal people versus the conservative people, you know, are arguing about, hold on, all these liberal people were the ones who created, created this model. Like we need right. to be, you know, it needs to be a little bit different than that. So I look forward to it, seeing what happens, but it's happening so fast. There's no turning back with that. So it is. And, and some of the new applications are now uh, like closer to present, present time. So uh, but, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. Well, well, Beck, you're doing amazing things. Um, I feel like there's something that we haven't talked about that you wanted to earlier, maybe is the, well, the self-improvement business. You said you wanted to come back to that. Oh, yeah. as Here's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about this, about um, I've been asked to introduce an, an, a, an amazing man. whose name is John Patrick Morgan, and he's going to be in Los Angeles next week. And I, I, I was thinking actually it was in my dreams last night. Cause I was thinking about all the things that are so amazing about him and why he's so different. And, and one of the things that I think is so incredible about him is he's had so many life experiences that mm. he's, he's been, he's had a band and he's a, he's an amazing philosopher and he's studied philosophy um, by going like the a philosopher from Prague. He went to Prague to study that he went to Greece to study different philosophers. He's got so many experiences. And I think that, that self-development also includes it, like creating opportunities for yourself to go out and do lots of different things and learn lots of different stuff. And I'm so glad I've had the opportunity to do that in my life. Like I learned to fly helicopters and that was a really cool experience for me to do that. Wow. I didn't keep on flying for a long time, but I learned, you know, I figured out, I got the experience of doing that. That was fun. And I've scuba dived and skydived and, you know, some of those scary things like that, but I'm a big diver now. I love diving and I, mm. and then cultural things going to, to different countries and being involved with, with different cultures. And uh, one of the women, a woman that I'm, that we're having on our show that I, that I'm talking to on Wednesday is a djembe drummer. And she's like an incredible djembe drummer. And she met her late husband who unfortunately died a couple of years ago. He didn't know you yet, or he wouldn't be, he'd still be here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but anyway, he was from Guinea. And so, mm. and they have a daughter who's now 16 and they've got, and she's been all over the world because his, his method of teaching drumming was also to include all the, the, the important things about the history and the rituals and why, and there's like drums for mourning drums for like mourning as in grief. And there's drumming mm. for, for different reasons and, and what that all means. And it's not just beating a sound, you know, a rhythm on something. So I'm eager to talk to her because she's got a different view of the world that I've never had because of her experiences. So I think when we talk about personal development, it's not just like the goal setting kinds of things and things that we think of that are maybe not as important now, or maybe you've graduated from, and or maybe you haven't done that yet. You should. But I feel like adding life experiences and cultural experiences to your life and, and your children's lives, I think is really important things. I think it's made me a different person today. And I'm obviously it's not done yet. You know, I've got a lot of, hey. <laughs> a lot of things I want to do, you know, like watching that, that man, that I'd like to watch the manned mission go up, you know, now that I said that, yeah, I'd like to see that go to, to Mars and, you know, just things like that or, orchestras and and going to concerts and imagining how in the world did they come up with that kind of a sound or mm. one guy ed sharon talking you know in wembley stadium and there's i don't know how many people that holds what would that be like to be right. that way and see like thirty thousand people or my friend nathan east same thing he just got off a tour with eric clapton like what that must be like it's just so, electrical yeah wonderful thank you for asking that question makes me excited to do more Man, well, uh, my feeling is you're just getting started. I mean, and and this is uh, it's really powerful, and so it's it's an honor to to see you on your journey, and and um, appreciate the the good uh, work that you're doing for the planet and for uh, putting out this great art. And super excited about your series that's coming up, the Art of Art. So, um, for people who want to get in touch with you or stay connected with your work. What, what's the best way for them to find you? Um, my website is beckyrobbins.com. My email is beckyrobbins1 at gmail. 
Um, I'm on Instagram as everything Becky and Facebook as Becky Robbins. It's pretty easy to find me. Awesome. Well, Becky, this has been phenomenal. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak to our audience. And for those of you who get this before November, let's see, the third, is that when you're, is that the Saturday? Fourth, which is Saturday. The fourth. Yeah. yeah. And you can make it if you live in, in uh, the La Jolla area. Um, I guess you'll have a, a preview there of, of yeah. the show. We so, will. Awesome. Thanks, Reagan. My, my pleasure, Becky. And, and everybody, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure you share this with your friends family, loved ones. Um, I think this is uh, will be a timeless show that you can share with anybody at any time because art is not going away and it's just going to get better. So Becky, thanks again for being on Unreasonable Help. Thank you. Have a fun day. Will do. Will do.